If you want to have high quality results consistently, you got to put in the work in the background. The most fun years were those years where I was kind of lost in, in the grind and didn't have anything and I was chasing something, you know. Today I'm chatting with Dustin Poirier. Dustin got 28 wins at the UFC. He is an interim lightweight champion. He had most, uh, most knockout victories in your weight division, yeah? yeah? Half of them by knockout, half your wins are knockouts. Yeah. The left hand's a real thing, huh? Sits them down. There's a, there's a few more accolades. I don't remember all of them, there's too many. What are, what are the other couple highlights uh, that people know about? I'm not sure. Uh, I fought in two weight divisions in the top uh, two or three in wins in the UFC history. That's one I'm proud of. Pauly never, never lost two fights in a row. Pauly Malinacci is my good friend and boxing coach, and he'll be happy if I say on camera that you gave Conor McGregor a hard time oh, on, yeah. oh, on I multiple forgot about occasions. Their, I forgot about their uh, back and forth when he was helping him spar and stuff like that. Shout out to Pauly. I know you watch him. Yeah, Pauly's a legend, man. No, he's really good. I learned a lot from Pauly. Pauly sees things that... Um, you know, I'm sure you have your, your version of this and your talents and your craft, you know, but when Paulie and I are working on boxing, some, you know, sometimes I really love this and some, I hate it in the moment, but I love it long term. As he sees about seven things at the same time, you know? Yeah. So there's a reason he was, uh, you know, he's not the hardest hitting guy in the world, but he's a multi-division champion. And uh, Just when you hear him, like on his commentary or whatever, you can, when you hear him speak, you can tell he's just intelligent and well studied in, in boxing, you know? Yeah, and I am an MMA fighter, but dude, I love, I love boxing. Yeah. So I do a lot of watching old fights and breaking down stuff myself. You grew up in Louisiana. Yeah. Tell me about it. Before you, before you had the most knockouts in your, uh, your division's history, <laughs> where, did, where did things start? What's your childhood like, man? Moved back, moved around with my mom um, in my grandmother's house. My mom and dad split up young, so me and my mom were, were on our own. And then, uh, you know, moved in and out of my grandmother's house, different apartments, things like that. Um, you know, growing up in, in Louisiana where I grew up, it's a lot of hard work. It's, you know, the community and the, and the, it's driven off of oil field and hard work. Not a, not a lot of big boom in business. Not a lot of like, I want to say intelligent people. They're, they're very intelligent, but what would say studied in school people. There's like a lot of roughnecks, you know, people making a living by, by hard work, labor work, a lot of labor jobs. So I was always around hard work. Never scared of that. And, uh, you know, I saw my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, all build the life they had through hard work and, and that just kind of rubbed off on me and the person I am and I just kept that going, you know, started working at a young age and didn't finish high school. Started, you know, kept kept working, grinding uh, and then f found fighting. When I was 17, you know, I wanted to be a boxer and uh, ran into some guys training mixed martial arts and this was around the time when the Ultimate Fighter was really blowing up and becoming, a, you know, MMA was making that that wave of being a mainstream thing, mm -hmm. people were talking about it. It was just getting on Spike TV. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you're like a longtime fan. The IFL was big and booming then. Um, but yeah, I found some guys training mixed martial arts at a boxing gym, and I didn't even know guys were training MMA in Louisiana where I was at, and I followed them back to their, their gym. And it's been a wrap since then, man. It's like a snowball, just every day more and more into it and fell in love with it, you know, and started fighting as an amateur, competing in jiu-jitsu things like that and turn it into, into a career. Yeah, I've been to New Orleans many times, so I don't know if that's uh, representative of Louisiana as a whole, uh, it's probably not fair, but um, and, you know, numerous times in the last 20 years I've been down there and, and I, I see that, that part of the culture that you're talking about. There's a lot of hard working people yeah. that are, it's, uh, it's not that they lack education so much, but it's just like, you can't be a dummy and work an oil rig and you're you going to mess up something badly, yeah, you know? Yeah, for sure. And you're going to get yourself hurt or your, your men hurt around you. So there's a there's a lot of that, that work ethic. I get that about your state and, and the environment. I grew up in central Illinois where there's a lot of corn. Yeah. So it's a little different environment. <laughs> a little different environment, but... Yeah, a lot of oil field jobs, a lot of, you know, shrimping and fishing jobs. Just get your hands dirty kind of work, you know? That's where I grew up around. Um, you close with your grandmother? You say you were in and out of there? Uh, my grandmother passed away, but yeah, she, I was very close with her. I was with my, my, my dad was around. My dad was, uh, my father and my uncle both got some 15 year prison sentences involved in some drug trafficking back in the 80s. And wow. so I, I grew up with my mother, her and I alone, and she wasn't the most responsible person or uh, the best role model. So uh, my grandmother was, you know, kind of took that place in my life or in my heart, you know? Yeah. So uh, when he said that, I thought about like, oh, I wonder if he had 
similar circumstances on that, that she passed away in 2012. Shout out to Grandma. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I, I, I was around all sorts of ruffians and idiots, and um, I think I, I learned a lot of things about what not to do in life from those people. You yeah. Know, they, I, I call them negative role models. You, they're still valuable lessons. But oh, for sure, man. Is, you know, I'm like, well, I'm for sure I'm not going to live my life that way, that way, or that way, because I see where that's going. So yeah. I was willing to work hard, but um, I didn't really know what to do. I didn't really have some way to point me in the right direction. So early in my life, there was a lot of guess and check that you, oh. you try something and make a mess and try something else and make a different type of mess. And um, I didn't need to mess up the same things too many times to learn from my mistakes and do a little bit better. But that kind of put me on a path where I spent a lot of time thinking about, like, how do I earn my way to have, like, a, you know, better teachers, better mentors. And I'm curious, your path from there that you, you know, you said... Uh, you, got, you kind of snowballed into, you know, the next training and the next training and turned into, you know, you're, you're ranked number one right now? Number was two, at, number two. Number two? Yeah. Oh, yeah, but I would just say you, you had, a, you've had a couple title fights, yeah? Yeah, three, three in the UFC. Oh. Um, I think Gaethje or somebody might have, you know, he's fighting for the title next. He yeah. might have passed me after my last fight, so I'm, I think I'm ranked number two right now. So you ranked number one at the time of... At the time of the, your last fight, you were yeah, a yeah, top of contender. Course, yeah. I see. I mean, I've, even at 145 pounds, I've probably been in the top 10 for the last eight years or so. You know, I've, I've been close to the top for, for a while. What's it take to live that kind of life? I think it takes a lot of self-reflection, man. Looking in the mirror, re, re, relearning things, redoing things, holding yourself accountable, I really think. You know, being, being consistent on that. Because, like... I can show up to the gym and have my coaches and have everybody there every day, but if I'm not mentally locked in, then I'm, you know, I'm just revving my engine. I'm not really getting anything out of it. So try not to fall into that groove of um, just doing things because I'm supposed to be doing it. Like I need to do it with passion and uh, yeah, reinventing myself. You know, after wins and after losses, looking back and saying I could have done this better or I made this mistake. You know, I, I take pride in saying I've never lost two fights in a row because that shows growth. You know, I've always put it together and and, and pick myself back up and got my hand raised. And I think that's just work ethic and, and being able to look back and say, you know, I, I really messed up here or maybe I didn't push myself as hard or, or every day or I wasn't focused. I kind of, I write down um, through training camp, I, draw, I have a, I draw a circle at the beginning of training camp and I write everything I can control in that circle. Mm. You know, like work ethic, diet, accountability, focus, um, my family, my wife and daughter, you know, being a husband, being a, the best father. I write all the things I can control directly in the circle and everything outside of the circle at the beginning of camp. And, and in the middle of that circle, I have the date of the fight. Everything outside of that circle, I write things that, that are gonna, I know they're gonna present themselves, but I can't control. Critics, um, my opponent, training partners, just ev everything that comes to mind, you know, and, and of, throughout the weeks of training camp, I might have to add a few things to, to both the inside or the outside of the circle. And, and through the week, I just kind of, you know, if I've had a rough day, if I have a, a good day, I, or, or just on the weekend, after a hard week of training, I'll open that, that notebook back up and, and kind of make sure my actions are aligned with my goals. Make sure I'm trying to walk in the path I think I need to be to be fully focused and fully committed to my family, but also fighting, because that's a juggling act. You know, because I haven't been a father my whole fighting career. You know, my daughter's five years old, so... Learning that, I'm learning on the, on the fly, learning on the job, you know, to, to be the best at that. So it's like a constant juggling act with everything. But if I can have these things that I anchor myself with, like this circle, and I, and I know, okay, I'm, all these things in this circle, I am focused on those. I'm doing my best. And that's all I can do. Everything else is just noise outside of that circle. I feel like that really helps me focus in. And then on top of that, write down the things I think I need to work on each day. If I get taken down, I want to make sure I don't, you know, next sparring or next wrestling se session, I want to maybe get two takedowns more or get taken out one time less. Just small things, small steps. Because um, that's just, honestly, that's pretty much my whole career is step by step, small steps, small steps until I can put it all together and, you know, beat these guys. And if I, if I do fail, you know, fail better than I, I did last time, I'm just trying to get better. You know, that, that's been my whole career. Um, yeah, that, that's it, man. You know, I see this uh, this fantasy land on social media where, you know, some some of those critics uh, they they got their commentary of, uh, 
you know, not much. You know, a critic is somebody that doesn't have the talent to do something that you that you or I are doing. You know, yeah. if they had the talent to actually do something, they wouldn't have time to be a critic. You know, you, you ever you ever win a fight or lose one, and then have you know, if you say, man, you know, would really make my day better right now is to go hate on some random people on yeah. the internet. I, I never felt that way. There's, yeah, there's sometimes they had. Uh, some really good financial victories, some other things that were, seemed like big victories that were so big that I couldn't imagine them 20 years ago. You know, it was unimaginable that I could have some of the circumstances I have today yeah. when I was younger. It never occurred to me to be, to go criticize random people on the internet or you know, go I, hate on somebody. That's a reflection of, you know, those people who are saying that stuff, they are just uncomfortable and with themselves and they have to project it on you, you know, because yeah. those people who say, I hate you or you suck, they don't, they don't know you, they don't know me, they don't know anything, they hate themselves, they don't like themselves, they're uncomfortable. <laughs> Thank you. You know what I mean? That's what I think of it. No, I, I say this all the time and my people know this, I say the, the number one thing a hater hates is himself. Yeah. The number one thing a hater hates is himself. Yeah. You, know, you ever been hated on by anybody doing significantly better than you at something? Right, it, it, it doesn't happen most of the time. It I, doesn't happen. I shook hands with 20 something, maybe 30 billionaires over the years and, and to, don't, none of them ever made fun of me for being poorer than them. Yeah, right. I was doing pretty good. <laughs> and there's a lot of things I'm, I'm a fan of or a lot of times I'm like, I don't agree with something somebody did in sports or in life, but I'm never gonna go on there and talk bad about them or, you know, I don't know them, it's not my place, you know? But when I see somebody doing something, you know, anything that takes significant talent and work ethic, like I'm pretty empathetic about it. That, you know, even if I'm even if I know somebody in a fight and I'm like, you know, I want my friend to win, you know, like I don't think the other guy's a f-ing bum or something. Like yeah. I'm still empathetic. Like, well, you know, he's the guy must be extremely talented too, or he wouldn't be there. Right. Guy must have, uh, you know, come through some tough circumstances in life as well, or he wouldn't be there. Yeah. So he, he, even. Even if I'm cheering for my friend, I don't necessarily, you know, hate his opponent. I want my friend to win. Yeah, of course. But, you know, I don't necessarily hate his opponent. Or, you know, and, and I'm, not, I'm not a big sports guy, by the way. Like, uh, I don't look at any other sports uh, outside of yours. And, you know, I, I train with some of these guys, and I know a lot of people in your industry. So uh, it's something that's, uh, you know, I'm, you know, as, a, as an amateur, I'm learning those sort of skills and building that. I'm doing pretty good, but again, I'm a, a business yeah. guy in his 40s. So. Did you have some good guys teaching you, the guys you were just telling me, so. You know, the, another, the other thing you talked about a bit was, uh, you know, that, that day-to-day grind of just, you know, grind, you're making incremental steps, little steps, but consistent. Yeah, consistent. Several little steps a day. And there's, the, other, the other thing that people see on the internet is, is um, you know, you're going to get rich quick, or you're going to get results at this or that overnight. And uh, I, I can't think of something much worse for a young person to pollute their brain with than to, to believe in that nonsense. That right. you're going to get champion results while doing mediocre people shit. Yeah. You engage in mediocre behavior and have you know extraordinary outcomes. That you, you ever seen that happen for anybody? Overnight success, type thing. Not in fighting. Not in much of anything. If you win, a, if you win a lottery, there's a good chance you're going to go bankrupt. Yeah, <laughs> they find a way to mess it up, and certainly not in fighting. Yeah, not in fighting. It took me 15 years to be an overnight success in fighting. I had this chat with Mike Chandler. We, yeah. we were down in Florida. He's training down there for uh, his last fight, and um, I had a, a Rolls Royce Phantom down there. We're sitting on the back of the Phantom and chatting together, and uh, Mike was saying that, you know, he'd been. He got popular at the, uh, at the UFC. That is, uh, you know, his name blew up quite a bit when he yeah. when he moved over to the UFC. And and he's a multi-time, multiple-time world champion yeah. in, in Bellator and yeah. three-time. You know, had some yeah. fight of the years with Eddie Alvarez and and done you know done some amazing things. But he had the most wins in Bellator history. Yeah. So he moves over to UFC and then you know the you understand the spotlight that is that you know brought a lot more attention to him. That just the name, the the machine, the UFC is. I mean. He told me that, you know, at the time we had the conversation, he was there about a year. And he told me that, you know, I've been an athlete every day for 20 years. You know, I show up to wrestling and, you know, then the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. A lot of wrestling is the early yeah. foundation and so on, you know. Most wins in Bellator history at the time, three-time champion, et cetera. And he says, uh, you know, now they call him overnight success. We're, we're laughing about right. this because I'm like, yeah, you know, uh, I started working on business stuff before I was 10. And so on and so on, and you know, it took me 35 years to be a, an overnight success. Yeah. Where, you know, it was a. Uh, I mean, when I was when I was young, it was, it was like a, a dream that you know I, I thought I could do it, but I didn't really have the confidence till my early 20s to go find like even 10 million dollars. You know, and 
the last couple of years, I made about $40 million, which is more than my whole net worth was wow. a couple of years ago, you know? And uh, so, you know, it only took me 35 years, and then you're an overnight success, you wow. know? Then you're in Bloomberg and Forbes and so on and so on, and you're overnight <laughs> success. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I never seen anybody, um, you know, accomplish things consistently. Yeah. If, if you, you might get lucky one time at something, yeah. it's hard to get lucky twice at something that's difficult. And uh, there's no consistency. Like, you know, if you, if you want to have high quality results consistently, you got to put in the work in the background, especially when nobody's watching, especially but when you don't want to. That's the thing. People just see the yield. They don't see the planting of the seed and the watering and the nurturing and the grind of every day of keeping something alive or keeping a dream alive. They just see the, you know, like you said, the overnight thing. The, whenever things do come together, they see that. They don't, you know, years and years of scraping by to get to that point. That's honestly, in, in fighting or in even like finances and success in fighting, I feel like I still have a lot to do for sure. But the most fun years were those years where I was kind of lost in, in the grind and didn't have anything and I was chasing something, you know. Those were the, you know, not that I'm done that, by, by done that part by any means, but when I was really lost in it and I didn't make any money and I was just getting a name and chasing these big fights, that was like the best, the funnest time fighting was for me. There was something special about that time, you know? The Ten Commandments Wealth went live on Easter Sunday. Join thousands of other people that made a commitment to a brighter future, to more prosperity, to brighter ways and better days. If you want to see the rest of this interview with this champion and many others, do yourself a favor. Click that link. I'll see you inside the Ten Commandments Wealth. Click that link. Funny, what should you do? Click the link right there. Do it now.